Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the second episode in our webinar series, Order Up, How Restaurants Adapted to the Pandemic. My name is Darren Clay, and I'm a chef with UBC Food Services, as well as the current president of the Chef's Table Society of British Columbia. As we begin, I would like to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Each of you are joining us today from many places, near and far, and I would also like to acknowledge the traditional caretakers of those lands. I would encourage everyone to take a moment and situ situate yourself in place. On whose territories do you currently reside? How are you accountable to the people of those lands? If you don't know whose territory you're on, we encourage you to begin that learning journey by doing some research to find out. And one way you can do this is by going to native-land.ca. Thank you again for joining us for the second installment of Farm to Globe, Transforming Our Food Systems, a webinar series focusing on what has become readily apparent, not only to our food system experts, but to the general public that our food systems need fixing. We'll be exploring the most pressing issues our food systems face today and hoping to find innovative solutions to these challenges. We'll also be focusing on the social and racial inequalities that are present in and exacerbated by all of these issues. Join us for discussions that we hope will drive up action and discover what steps we need to take to transform our food systems from farm to globe. The series is presented by the Center for Sustainable Food Systems at the UBC Farm, generously supported by RBC Royal Bank and in partnership with the UBC Faculty of Land and Food Systems, as well as the BC Food Web. The Center for Sustainable Food Systems at UBC Farm is a teaching and research center, as well as a local to global food hub working towards a more sustainable food secure future. Their mission is to innovate from field to fork to achieve resilient, thriving, and socially just food systems for all. BC Food Web is a web portal project which aims to increase access and connection to current research and other resource materials. In addition, it aims to encourage innovation between farmers and researchers for future project collaborations. And the Faculty of Land and Food Systems is a world leader in research and teaching about a sustainable and healthy food supply. Today's webinar topic is Order Up, How Restaurants Adapted to the Pandemic. We are very fortunate to have Shira Bluestein, Chef Robert Clark, and Justin Tisdale speak about their experiences in the restaurant industry from the past year, the challenges and the successes, and what the pandemic has changed about their businesses forever. Just a little bit of housekeeping. After each panelist gives a brief presentation, we will then move on to the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have questions for the panelists, please navigate to the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom control panel and share them with us. Also, feel free to upvote other questions by clicking on the thumbs up symbol. If you would like the opportunity to chat with other attendees, the chat feature will be available. However, inappropriate and offensive comments will not be tolerated and you will be immediately removed from the webinar. Lastly, we ask you to bear with us if there are any unexpected technological difficulties or distractions. All right, let's get going. First up, we have Shira Bluestein. Shira Bluestein, my apologies. Before becoming a restaurateur, Shira was playing music and punk and indie rock bands that toured extensively through Europe and North America. Those years spent traveling as a vegetarian were both enlightening and extremely frustrating. It became Shira's mission to create a vegetable forward dining experience where creativity reigned and the uniqueness of ingredients were openly explored and celebrated. Shira and her team have been dedicated to establishing meaningful connections with local farms, foragers, and wineries, showcasing the amazing terroir-driven food and wine BC has to offer. Since opening in 2012, the Acorn has picked up national awards for excellence, has been featured in the New York Times, Bon Appetit, and was deemed one of the best vegetable forward destinations in the world by CNN and the Daily Meal, earning the number one spot for best vegan restaurant in the world by Big Seven Travel. In 2016, Bluestein opened The Arbor, a casual sequel to The Acorn, with the same uncompromising attention being paid to quality, detail, and plant-based deliciousness. I'll hand it over to you now, Shira. 
Thanks, Darren. Thanks everyone for having me. Thank you. I'm really grateful to be here. Uh, so I have a short presentation and I'm going to do my best to share my screen. Okay. And here we go. So for those of you who don't know me, and sadly this is the best picture I have of my family. <laughs> Uh, my name is Shira Bluestein. I'm the founder of the Acorn and the Arbor restaurants on Main Street. I'm also a wannabe ceramic artist, a keyboardist and vocalist for whoever will have me in their band. I am a mother of two kids under four, one of which was born a year ago today. That's the little one there in the bottom left screen. Uh, so to say this has been a life altering time is a serious understatement. But the story isn't about me. It's about our community of farmers who supply our restaurants. This is Lydia, owner and head farmer of Cropthorn Farm. She and her family run team grow organic veggies on over 24 acres in Delta. They practice sustainability from, from their farming to their zero waste delivery systems and grow all year round. So we get to work with them through all the seasons. We're so grateful for their commitment and passion to growing some of the best produce around. Anna Marie and Kevin of Clippers Organics Farm have been working with the Acorn for over six years. As two of the hardest working people we've ever met, we've loved watching their family run business grow from organic farming to producing some of the tastiest pickles and preserves available. They also started a cidery with the organic fruit that is sustainably grown on their orchard. Acorn has done three dinners up at their farm in Coston, often with the help of their kids running and serving the food alongside me. You haven't lived until you've tasted a tree ripened peach from Clippers in the summer. Trish Sturdy up in Pemberton is the head farmer at North Arm Farm. Her family team grows everything from garlic to potatoes to berries, and we love them most for their root vegetables, which keep us going through the winter. When Trish isn't farming, she's driving the school bus for the kids up in Pemberton. Her knowledgeable and generous spirit is inspiring. And if you are ever in the area, we recommend visiting her 53 acre farm. Those are just some of the farmers that we work with. I mean, the list is endless. I just picked three as an example. When you think about the horrific start to this pandemic adventure, you might remember the collapse of our food systems. Even the most food secure individuals were scrambling to fill their pantries. Eggs, flour, milk, beans were all emptied from the grocery store shelves with no sign of being restocked. We feared not only for the safety of our community, our staff and our businesses, but being six months pregnant, I also felt like I was bringing a baby into the apocalypse. Would there even be a world left? I can't begin to relive the trauma I experienced, closing both restaurants and laying off our 50 staff with the future so uncertain. Our farmers who at the time relied primarily on supplying restaurants and selling at farmers markets were suddenly cut off from their customers. Meanwhile, the reduced global supply chain and hoarding mentality of the public left households without grocery staples and fearing starvation. Everything was spiraling out of control. Back at the Acorn, we had closed so quickly that our fridges and cold storage were full of produce. We had something like 600 eggs in our walk-in. We met our chef after being closed for a day and shifted our energy from helplessness to action. Our plan was to connect our customers directly to these beautiful organic veggies and hopefully provide some stability in everyone's lives. And with that, the Acorn market was born. We photographed what we had in house and set up an online store overnight. Our veggies, eggs, and other staples found their way safely into people's homes. We were able to keep a few staff employed who were not eligible for the government support. And once we got the hang of it, we expanded to offering everything from prepared items to heat and serve meals to the ever popular sourdough. We partnered with friends, growers, and other local producers to build up the market and even offered free local delivery with no minimum order for those who were in quarantine. There was always enough to feed our staff 
and we, we made sure to deliver the extras to those who needed it most. Eventually, restaurants could open again. The farmer's market regained momentum and food security for most people returned. Many farms had done their own pivoting, finding retailers and other avenues to sell their produce. And the acorn market online became less of an essential service. There are many lessons in the story, but one is the recognition and acknowledgement of how quickly our global supply chain broke and that supporting our local economy is really the best and most sustainable choice for the environment and the future. Many restaurants are trapped in a cycle of thinking that large scale suppliers are the only option. And while yes, it is convenient to order your dishwasher chemicals and tomatoes from the same place, chew on this for a minute. In 2018, at the Every Chef Needs a Farmer, Every Farmer Needs a Chef Forum, we met Abdul Majid, founder of BC Garlic. Until that time, we'd been looking, we had been buying imported peeled garlic and we're looking for a local option. Abdul gave us a quote that was three times more expensive than the cost of our imported garlic. We were shocked. With food costs already something that is monitored so closely, it didn't seem like a feasible option for us. We decided to give it a try and here's what we learned. BC garlic was so robust and flavorful that even though the cost was three times more, we had to adjust our recipes and only needed to use one third of the amount of garlic. So this tiny change, change had such a profound impact on us. We got to support our local economy, reduce our carbon footprint, work with a superior organic product, and it didn't cost us a thing. I'm grateful to be here today, I do this. speaking in front of you, having survived this pandemic as both a mother and business owner. We're just starting to tell the stories of the pandemic and understand its impact on everyone. This is just one of those small stories. I'm excited for the future of this industry, but we have a lot of work to do. And I never ever wanna hear the word pivot ever again. Thanks. <laughs> I'm with you on that one, Shira. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. That was fantastic. Okay. Next up, we have Robert Clark. Uh, chef Robert Clark is a world-renowned chef, cookbook author, and ocean-friendly seafood advocate. Clark is the chief culinary officer of Organic Ocean Seafood. In the past, Robert has been the executive chef at Sea Restaurant, Rain City Grill, and New in Vancouver, and more recently was the proprietor of the Fish Counter on Main Street. He's also a co-founder of Vancouver's Spot Prawn Festival. Oh, and one other small note, uh, he became a member of the Order of Canada in November of 2020. Clark is the co-founder of OceanWise and was honored as a 2011 SeaWeb Sustainable Seafood Champion for supporting the consumption of ocean-friendly seafood. He's pleased to be working with Indigenous fishery partners of Organic Ocean. He identifies as a challenger of the status quo and an advocate of authentic living, sustainable seafood and transparency in our food system. And I'm gonna hand it over to him now. Thank you, Darren. Welcome everyone, share a great presentation. Basically mine, but talking about fish instead of vegetables instead of fish. Uh, thank you everyone for, for joining us here today. Thank you, UBC, everybody at UBC for, uh, for allowing us this forum to, to talk about what's important uh, to Canadians' future and, and food is one of the top three necessities of life after oxygen and water. And I don't think as Canadians or as uh, North Americans, we, we give it enough respect. And the pandemic has really demonstrated that. And I hope that it's, uh, it's a paradigm for us to actually improve something that we uh, have been mismanaging and misdoing since uh, the end of the Second World War. Uh, for the pandemic, I've actually gone through it or worked through it from two different points of view. Uh, when it started, I owned the fish counter. Uh, fortunate enough for me, we were already a uh, retailer and uh, a takeout type operation. So the pandemic uh, wasn't as devastating to us as it was to, to most of my, uh, my friends and colleagues. So I was very fortunate in that aspect. Um, and, uh, and I'm grateful. I was grateful for that. Uh, now I'm with Organic Ocean. I'm the Chief uh, Culinary Officer. And um, my goal 
I mean, I've been retired from a chef for a number of years, but my goal first with the fish counter was to demonstrate that you can have a business that's uh, socially, uh, um, community orientated, economically and sustainably viable by making the right choices. In, in my case, it was serving ocean-wise uh, seafood. And I think Mike and Mike, my partner, myself demonstrated that all the naysayers that said they have to, uh, they have to sort of sell uh, poorly harvested, uh, mislabeled, misrepresented, imported seafood to survive. Um, I mean, they're not going to take any notice of what we did there. But uh, I feel better knowing that it is that it is possible. Organic Ocean now has given me an opportunity um, to further my my bigger agenda of of food security. And uh, when the pan I wasn't with them when the pandemic started, but they did an amazing job going. They lost 75% of their business overnight as a supplier to, to high-end white tablecloth restaurants here in Canada, as well as in, uh, in Asia. Uh, they, they, their markets dried up overnight and they, they had a little small cash flow based on their, their uh, business to business sales to fish, uh, to uh, fish stores and, uh, other distributors and wholesalers, uh, but they were they were in serious trouble, just like just like restaurants. They had they had a bit of an advantage that they weren't completely closed, but they had to make some decisions. And I'm sorry, sure, but I'm going to use the word pivot. They successfully um, they were they'd been toying for a while with um, with the idea of, of getting into the online. Um, sales realm is that's a huge growing. I mean, the, the demand for sitting at home and ordering online um, is, is the largest growing segment of our economy. Uh, and, and, they, and that idea had come to through their minds, but they'd never really uh, put any energy or time into it. And, and the pandemic forced them to do that. And within two weeks, they got themselves up a, an online store. They'd shifted their, um, their inventory or created more inventory that was, was not geared for chefs like whole fish, but uh, portions, family sized portions, friendly portions uh, that could be easily consumed at home. And then they, they presented that to the general public and it, and it proved to be a very successful uh, idea for them. And it took off quite quickly and so quickly that they, they it gave them some breathing room to, to, uh, to pursue it further. And uh, the concept of getting it across the country was, was the next in line and they, they worked on that. It took them a while. The biggest obstacle was um, um, finding recyclable uh, and biodegradable um, shipping, a shipping mechanism or a shipping container, packaging boxes. Uh, I mean, Organic Ocean is a, is a member of, is a B Corp, member of B Corp. Uh, they're 1% they, they're for the planet. They, donate food to, to the needy. They're very, well, they, it's me now, it's us now, us. I gotta keep remembering, it's us. Uh, we um, are, have very uh, social, social, we feel we're socially responsible to, to take care of, of the environment as well as other members of our community. Um, and I don't even know why I'm going down that tangent. Now. Anyway, that's what we do, so that's why, so that's why I got involved with it. Um, and my goal to, to increase food sovereignty opposed to security is, is I'm convinced that the only way we can have true food sovereignty, hence food security, is to actually produce as much food as we can at home. And as was stated in the last by Shira, there's nothing more important than, than uh, supporting local, buying local, and increasing our ability to produce our own food. The, the, the beginning of the pandemic, very evident, empty shelves. Why were there empty shelves? If we rely on other countries to feed us, at some point they will decide to feed their own people before they feed us. And then what are we going to do if we can't produce our own food? The only way to improve that situation is to encourage ourselves to produce more food. And that's that's my goal. On Ontario, what attracts me now moving forward, the pandemic has given me an opportunity to, to uh, maybe leverage um, our ability to get more ocean-wise friendly seafood into Southern Ontario. And I talk about all across Canada, but the majority of our population lives in the Golden Horseshoe. And the chefs there are very um, locally focused as well. Very, I mean, they believe in sustainability and they believe in buying local, supporting local, but they're so far from the ocean that seafood doesn't fall in, really fall into their the parameters of what they work on. They worry about where their lamb comes from and they're, and rightly so, and they're, and their cabbage and their carrots. But seafood is something 
not foreign to them, but it's it's not right there. So they don't believe there's something they can do about it. So they don't spend as much energy as I think they should in sourcing from both from both our coasts. I mean, we have great seafood suppliers on both coasts, and and I think that it will be a key to keeping them and supporting them uh, to feed us moving into the future. So getting uh, ocean-wide seafood into Ontario is a bit more challenging than getting it into, say, across BC, where we're very sensitive to uh, the health of our ocean. So going direct to consumers, um, I believe, is, is, is a more powerful way to get more sustainable seafood into, into the homes in Ontario. And, and that's, that's what my push is here at Organic Ocean. And I think it'll be, from a business point of view, it'll be very, very beneficial for the company. And from a personal point of view, I think it can really move my personal agenda forward, which is, which is really what you should be working on when you're when you're in retirement in your in your older years. Hence, my beard is a lot grayer than it was in the introductory picture. That's got to be an old picture. Anyway, I want to thank everyone again. I just wanted to have my little say and uh, please if, walk away from here thinking: buy local, support local, truly understand that the cost. It may be a few more dollars, but the cost of not doing it is, will be far, far uh, greater than if we actually uh, spend a little bit more money here at home. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. That was great. Um, next up, we have uh, Justin Tisdale. Uh, Justin is the co-owner and operator of Duke Fried Chicken and Beatbox. Justin is also a council member of 10 by 10 Philanthropy and was previously the beverage and restaurant manager for Shangri-La Hotel Vancouver. Tisdale has made a name for himself by remaining consistently ahead of the curve. He got in on the ground floor of the casual comfort food and high quality takeout trend with the beginning of Juke and has adapted to the growing demand for vegan and vegetarian options with the launch of Beatbox. He began his career almost 20 years ago as a bartender to subsidize his competitive swimming on Canada's national team and he has his approached each restaurant position since with that same competitive spirit. Juke and Beatbox both represent Justin's unique approach and culture of questioning the status quo. So I'll hand it over to you now, Justin. Thanks, uh, Darren. Hi, everybody. Uh, UBC, thanks for having me. Uh, Sheer and Robert, thank you guys for going first. This is the nerves a little bit. Uh, so yeah. I'm uh, the owner of Juke Fried Chicken, Beatbox, and a little cocktail bar now that we call Chickadee Room. Uh, kind of like Shira, when COVID started, um, we didn't know what to do. We were afraid of where we're going. We were afraid of what the business has held. Um, I remember being sleepless at night. And I think the first thing I did was I penned a thank you kind of eulogy for both our businesses at the time, thinking we were basically about to lose everything. The next day I woke up, met with my business partner, and we figured out what we needed to do to get through this. Um, we knew a big part of Juke was being socially aware, socially conscious, working within our communities. Uh, so that's where we started. We knew if dining rooms were closed, takeout was allowed to happen, we already had a little bit of a head start in the game than most of our friends um, in the restaurant industry. So we sat down with anyone who wanted to meet with us in other restaurants on how to set up your food to take out, how to package your sauces, how to make sure it travels well, how to negotiate with the delivery companies. Um, so we took a lot of time with other businesses uh, for us to do that. At the same time, we knew that third-party delivery wasn't necessarily sustainable for every company. Uh, and fortunately, a company named From2 or From yeah, from two came along a local delivery company with no commissions uh, that really wanted to work with independent restaurants and help them develop a sustainable delivery model. So we worked really heavily with them. Um, so both Juke and Beatbox were already take up forward. So we didn't have to adapt as much as everyone else. Um, but we really needed to analyze how we were going to evolve and expand our business, not so much pivot, but create other revenue streams uh, that would help keep basically our company afloat. Um, I remember in 2008, I was working at the Shangri-La Hotel and the president of the Shangri-La sent out an email to everybody during that recession that there'll be no employees let go during that period. So we took the same model with our staff. We sat down with everybody and we said, look, 
We don't know what the future holds. Everything's closed. We think we might be able to do takeout. If you guys want to work, we have a place for you. We'll find something for you to do. So that was the first thing we started with our inner community, just our staff. We made sure that we knew food was flying off shelves in grocery stores. We knew if our staff was working, they might not be able to get to grocery stores before they opened, before they closed. So we made sure between both our restaurants, our staff had a free meal for them and a partner, spouse, roommate, any shift they worked. So that was the first thing we did. Then we looked at, again, our industry, our friends, and we created something called Industry Mondays, which was a two-hour period Monday night where all the sales generated in that time were donated to local charities, hospitality charities, BIPOC charities, anything we could do to just start supporting our community because we knew that even with the takeout model we had, whether it increased or decreased, we were still in an okay situation when other people weren't as lucky. Then we looked at ways we could keep our brands out there. So we created a full product line at Beatbox of our vegan sauces. Um, we packaged a lot of our chicken wings, our chicken coating, our seasoning, hot sauces at Juke. Uh, we started selling those just through our online store. Uh, it didn't bring in much revenue, but it was just a way we could start kind of moving some products so it wasn't dying on the shelves because we just like sure, we work with local farms as well, and we want to make sure we're still purchasing from them so we can help their business, help their community, and also help us on the end as well. Uh, then we figured we could work with other companies like Legends Hall and Fresh Prep that were buying things in bulk that really helped us move more product along. Uh, and that, that was kind of the turnaround for Beatbox. We thought Beatbox was going to go under because we knew a lot of our vegetarian, vegan, flexitarian people could cook a bit more at home. Uh, but we knew Juke was kind of comfort food that people wanted and, and Juke was getting by okay at that time. Um, so then the next aspect of our business was we looked at how can we, we're not a fine dining restaurant. We're not, you know, 50, $60 average guest check. Our average guest checks like 15, $16. So if people aren't coming in, we need to contact more people. So then we thought about ways we could sell unique items larger so you can buy for you know two people that might be in your bubble or your family of four that might be in your bubble so we created our you know some slushy buckets larger packages for juke larger packages um at beatbox as well and those things started to work and i think our goal was nothing was going to be huge but everything added up together hopefully would get us through the end of this pandemic. uh and then after we looked at daily sales, we started looking at how takeout and dining was going to happen for special events. So Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, and we worked out kits knowing that people would be dining differently this year. You know, you may not be with your family, you might just be with your roommate. How can we make it easy for you to enjoy a great meal? Um, and then that being said, we, after that, we looked at, okay, we, we've kind of maximized what we can do through the business. Now, how do we support and work with other local independent businesses? And we can each use each other's community and voices to spread the word about what local independent is really doing. Uh, so then we came up with partnerships with Taco Fino, Beta 5, Rain or Shine, DL Chicken, Zachlin Farms. We've got a few more coming down as well, but that was the way that you, know, you can utilize their resources, they can utilize our resources. It keeps costs down in terms of preparation of product. Um, but in terms of marketing, getting the name out there, that worked really well. Uh, around this time, um, kind of like Sheer, I had a daughter about three weeks before the pandemic hit. I was up one night with her and <clears throat> the George Floyd thing happened. And so that made me really reassess what mattered uh, in life and in our business. So that's when we took the time to really, I never really put myself forward in what Juke was doing. I was always, I was always behind the scenes working to like push our team forward, never like pull them behind me. Uh, and at that time we kind of felt, I felt it was something I had to do. And the BLM movement, the BIPOC movement really changed how we operate. Um, within our company, within how we speak, how we communicate to each other, 
you know, the charities we want to work with, um, the reason we're doing some things. And so that was a big moment, kind of holding my daughter and watching all that go down. Um, and I think that changed our company forever moving forward from there. Um, so that aside, we still knew like, sorry to kind of jump from one thing to another. Uh, but that aside, we still knew dining rooms were closed. We still knew we didn't know if they would ever reopen again or if they would, what the new landscape would look like. So we took the opportunity uh, to go down fighting. So Duke had a dining room and we basically created a cocktail and snack bar. We fully renovated it. You know, not the time to spend money, but we figured, you know, if we're going to lose everything, what's a few more dollars when you're trying to survive this? So we created the Chickadee Bar. Um, and Chickadee is cocktail forward. It allows us to have a bit of a new identity um, and gave Juke's dining room a little fresh start. So then it was like Juke was its own takeout thing. And then we had a cocktail bar. Um, from the cocktail bar, we figured we could start doing special things through that, like cocktail kits, you know, things for your anniversary, stuff for Valentine's Day. We've created a bunch of syrups, and it just helped us increase that line of products um, that we could work with local farmers on, um, like getting, you know, some of our flowers, some of our basil, our cherries, whatever we're using for those flavors, um, and really just keep pushing forward with that. So I like to say we didn't really pivot. We just found new ways to kind of enhance the business. Took advantage of what the city was offering. Um, you know, got our temporary patio, looking at redoing all our website with the BC grant. Uh, and then we really assessed how we're going to get through special events. What can we do to help people eat at home better? And that was kind of the whole goal from the start. Um, once we worked with Able BC and BC government, you know, a lot of new liquor laws came into play and that was a big help. Um, as Robert knows, you don't make a ton of money off selling food, make more of your, your business comes from selling alcohol because it's just lower cost, less labor. Uh, so that was a huge help, I think, in getting restaurants just to the point where they could operate again. Um, and then we really looked at it was a bit overwhelming, but we kind of looked at every month, what events were happening every month. How could we just do something, work with somebody to do a special event? Uh, and so we came up with a bunch of these different promotions. And those promotions, both for Juke and Beatbox, it was basically one a month, which really gave us something to speak about in a time where there wasn't a ton of information going on and restaurants we're pivoting really well. Some restaurants turned into like little grocers, some turned into like special specialized markets, some went to complete like veggie shops, whatever it was, people were doing fun things. So this gave us a chance to continue that, work with other businesses doing that. Um, so yeah, the strategy was constant stream of content. Uh, we wanted to be really transparent with our customers on every level um, in terms of where we stood basically politically on the BLM movement, what we were doing with our community, how we were keeping staff involved, whatever it was, we just really wanted to make sure that the messaging was proper. Uh, and in that, like safety trumped everything. We wanted our staff to, our staff to be safe, our guests to be safe. Um, and if that wasn't ever gonna happen, we were prepared not to open. Uh, through that, that marketing gave us a lot of impressions, gave us a little bit of radio and TV airtime, um, but we realized all that was a bit limiting uh, and we didn't own it. So we created, you know, really pushed our social media more, created some newsletters, which were highly effective. If there's anyone out there who has a restaurant, start a newsletter. Uh, we found it was the most effective thing. People were opening it at more, like at a greater rate than we saw people even looking at our social media. Um, so we adapted and we just kind of increased our revenue streams. Uh, and then for the future, right now and continued, it's still on health and safety. Still want to create our online uh, digital marketing. So we're working on in-store sauce lines, uh, packaging all our items so they can be a bit more shelf stable. Takeout and delivery was something we're never going to compromise on, but we, we knew we had to push back against some of those delivery companies to negotiate rates that would allow restaurants to survive. Like if a restaurant only makes 15% and delivery companies were charging 25% commission, you're operating at a loss. So it wasn't beneficial to anyone. 
Um, we're still going to work on creative home offerings. Like I said, we created the chickadee room and changed our physical space. We've extended our outdoor dining um, and just kept new channels of revenue moving. So that's how we did it. Uh, when I look back on it, it's been an insane 15 months. Uh, a lot of quick movements, just being me and a business partner, we could adapt really quickly. So thank you for listening. Thank you for my time. Uh, any questions, let us know. Thank you so much, uh, Dustin, that was great. Uh, so we're moving into the uh, question and answer period of the event. And please, for any of the uh, participants, uh, please continue to post questions uh, as we kind of go through and we'll kind of open this up to all three of our panelists. So feel free, uh, anybody to hop in. Uh, I know it's a little harder on Zoom to uh, have all of the, the, the proper uh, being played when not talking over each other, but uh, I guess uh, we'll start by, uh, you know, asking, um, if you could do anything differently, um, obviously a lot of lessons were learned on the fly. And if there's anything about the hospitality industry uh, is full of very, very creative people. Um, but if you could go back uh, and prepare for a similar disturbance, what was kind of the big lessons that you all learned from this? Uh, I'll start. I think that not, I mean, I thought about this, like, I don't know what we could have, how we could have prepared for this. I know like what restaurants are doing now is more so like uh, opening with sort of a pandemic preparation in mind. So being more takeout friendly, having maybe a little more retail savvy, less focus on high touch food, because those are all things that were just not, they went out the window <laughs> with the pandemic. But I mean, we just wouldn't have survived without the government subsidies. And so if a pandemic ever hit again, I, I think it would be the same case for us anyways, for a lot of restaurants and a lot of, I think, independent businesses. I, I yeah, I mean, I thought about this. I just don't know how to, how to have prepared for it. Anyone else? I, I just jump on that too and say really, there's not much you could have done to prepare, but looking back, it's like communicate with the government as much as you can to try to get that support you need. I think initially, obviously everyone's scrambling, um, but those were the things that kept, you know, restaurants afloat when people have put their lives on the line, their houses on the line to, you know, open these doors and feed people. And uh, I'll figure it out in a second. There, we're on mute. Oh, you good? I don't have to answer that. Great. No, you're still. <laughs> yeah, you do. You're no, still on there, Robert. I think from from the business the business aspect of it, I mean, it's it's hard to prepare. Like like was mentioned. I mean, I you don't. It's you you can't get ready for the unforeseenable. And even even the pandemic, the next time it's going to be different. And it's going to affect us a different way. I think what's important is we need to prepare not as individual businesses, but as the entire community. And to prepare as an entire community is to set it up that we actually are a community. And, I, and I'm speaking about that as far as uh, producer, supplier, consumer uh, relationship, right? And that goes back to buying local, supporting local, sustaining local economy, whether it's your, whether it's your carrot farmer, your fisherman, your local restaurant, your bar, what, whatever it may be. That, that shelters whatever else goes on in the world. That, that gives us some insulation and so i mean if a pandemic hits and we can't get all our carrots come from california we're not gonna be able to get carrots the borders closed whatever whatever is going on they're hungry so they're going to eat all the carrots but if we have a local carrot farmer they will do everything that they can to get those carrots to feed the people to feed us whether it's to feed our restaurants to feed our our, our uh, community supported uh, agriculture initiatives our home deliveries whatever it is we need to produce more food here in Canada. We don't have to give up bananas, pineapples, coffee. That's not what this is about. But if we grow carrots, we should encourage the consumption, uh, the production of more carrots, it's enough to feed us. And, and to put the infrastructure into place, it would be cheaper to put the infrastructure into place to enable us to, to can vegetables, freeze vegetables, dehydrate vegetables, and fish and meats and all these types of things that we can actually, what we make, what we grow, what we produce, 
we can consume locally throughout the year. Our whole, our whole concept of fresh is better than frozen is ludicrous. Uh, I never mentioned that, but I mean, that's the great thing about uh, um, how organic ocean approaches uh, uh, seafood. Like the seafood that we ship across the country is frozen. It's not fresh. Frozen is the most sustainable as far as waste is concerned. This quite, I saw a question in the, in the Q&A about pandemic and waste and eliminating waste. Frozen, there is no waste with frozen food because it doesn't go bad. There's no urgency to get it to market. It will last for, I mean, depending on the product, two months to, to a year. So we need, as a society, we need to get, now I'm starting to preach. Is our time almost up here? As a society, we need to get used to the fact that fresh isn't the most sustainable. Fresh is great. Yeah, you, you catch a fresh salmon, you cooked in hook and line, or you went down to the boat, you bought, there's nothing better. But do we really need to be eating fresh salmon in Houston, Texas? That's that's the question, right? Or should it be frozen? Should it be canned? Should it be dry? These, these types of things to, to move our population and our species forward. Anyway, frozen's great if it's high quality. Lose that. Goodbye. <laughs> And uh, I guess that makes me ask the, what your thoughts are, all three of you, on if there's anything, I mean, anytime you have such a momentous event like the, the pandemic, uh, there's opportunity for change, and you would be foolish not to use this opportunity. Um, so I'm just curious if there's anything that uh, you're happy that you got rid of, or your business model could, could change, or something that... Um, because when the wheels are moving, it's very hard to make any changes because you're just, you're, you're in it. Um, but when you have a chance to pause and reflect, uh, it's a great opportunity. So I'm just wondering if there's anything you're happy that you could change about your businesses uh, for the better. I don't, I don't I'll, sorry, but I, I, it's not something that I'm happy about, but like in the last pre-pandemic, the before times, the thought of closing for a day was like, no. If the fridges went down, if the power was out, whatever it took, you did everything you could to, to be open that day. And there was like never any reason to close. And since the pandemic now, it's like, oh, you know, our team, I, it's just different. There's just a different, a kinder approach to how we do business, I think, as a, as a whole and how we hopefully are looking after our whole team. And it's like, if people need to be sick or are sick, they they should not come to work. That was something that, you know, I mean, in the restaurant industry, it's notorious for like how it, it, everyone just pushes through their, whatever they're feeling to be there. And I think what has changed is basically a lot of the cracks of the industry are revealed in how broken this industry is on a lot of ways in the way that it takes care of its people. And so hopefully what can change moving forward for everybody is like, we are kinder to each other as a team. We allow people to take the time that they need to, and they're not pushing through everything. They need sick time. If we need to close because something isn't working, that's, we just do it. It's just different. Hopefully our customers are a little more grace, uh, giving a little more of that space for restaurants to do that too. I'd, I'd also say, I'd second that like, you know, I think I'm the only member on my staff of the family, but I'm home earlier now. I spend more time with my kids. Uh, our staff are, you know, working regular hours, you know, taking care of themselves. And the only thing we did in the restaurant that was physical was we got rid of a lot of the menu that required way too much work or way too much wastage. So we started saving on that. And, uh, but I think as second year's notion, it's just, I think created a, a more healthier work environment for our team. Robert, do you have anything to add? It takes me a while to figure out how to unmute. I'm not very brave. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it was summed up, it was summed up perfectly. I mean, that's my only regret is I, I had to retire to actually get to go home earlier and and then have a life work balance. So for, for young chefs, I hope that this actually, uh, uh, gives them some incentive to actually be part of this wonderful industry that can be so rewarding and it doesn't take your soul and your and and you have to make compromises whether you go to a wedding or whether you have to go to work like these types of you know spend more time with your children i think this is it's 
it's a positive thing. There's always positive things in every disaster. There's always some silver lining. And the hospitality industry, whether it's the industry itself or, or um, how it's connected to our food systems, it's been broken on all kinds of levels and, and now is, is an opportunity to actually fix a lot of those. And that's, that's what I'm looking forward to seeing from uh, the young, creative, uh, energetic uh, generation that's, that's going to, to, to help us through this, right? And uh, I mean, Robert, you you are a, you are a supplier, uh, and so I'm just curious for the three of you what what you've noticed um, because that's been a common theme um, for Shira and Justin uh, as talking about their suppliers. What you've seen or how things have changed with that relationship um, between chefs and suppliers? Because uh, when when COVID first happened, what my what I noticed was a lot of talk about uh, restaurants about chefs. Uh, but very little talk about all the suppliers um, and uh, and that relationship. So I'm just curious what uh, what you've noticed o over the years and, and that relationship, uh, how strong it is and, and the importance and, and making, I guess, the public, if, if they recognize that, the how symbiotic that relationship it needs to be. I'll go first for a change. Um, since I figured out how to unmute myself. The, ev the evolution now, now, I mean, the story, the connection, it's evolved over time. I mean, 40 years ago, 45 years, whenever I started, the only conversation was about how wonderful a maitre d' was. Then it became how wonderful the chef was. Then it became how wonderful that the chef was using uh, Doug's tomatoes. Th that were, now it's like, oh, now we actually know Doug. Now we actually have a connection to, to the tomato. And, and and that evolution, as far as dining, uh, is getting the consumer closer and closer to the source. And that is the single most important thing we can actually do here in North America. Because in other cultures in the world, they're connected to their food. You want you go to Italy, get somebody upset, just talk about like what's going on or how passionate they are about what they produce or what they eat or how they make it. Here, here food has always just been an energy. It hasn't been a part of our, uh, of our culture or, our, or the social fabric of necessity of life. Uh, and I think with, with the pandemic and, and, and the closer the supplier, I mean, here at Organic Ocean, we're a bit unique because we're a producer and supplier. Not all, not all producers supply and not many suppliers produce. You know, so we're, 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 two, we're engaged in two of the three, of the three steps to get, to get produce to, uh, to the consumer, whether it's, whether it's the chef or whether, whether it's the customer. So, so we're, we're in a different position than, than most. We're already connected. Uh, we, we try very, because, because of how the business is set up. Um, I think for, in the case of restaurants, if I, still, if I still worked in a restaurant or if I still was still in a chef or restaurant, even 20 years ago, the most important thing was to get to know where your food came from. I mean, I was no interest in bankers who could lend me money to open a fancy restaurant. I was more interested in the fact that there was a farmer or a fisherman sitting in the restaurant and I wanted to, to know more about what he does or how he does it or why he does it. Um, and I think that's important. The more consumers, the general public understand why producers produce, what, why they do what they do, I think we'll have a much more respect uh, um, for the food that we, uh, we consume. I don't even know if that was the answer to the question. What was the question? <laughs> Well, there was that was that was good. What you said, about, I liked what you said about uh, the evolution of uh, of knowing of knowing those uh, those producers. Yeah, it's important. Now, Shira and Justin, do you have anything you want to add? I just say, um, you know, I find Vancouver is like a really food savvy city in terms of restaurants. But kind of what Robert said, there's a disconnect to uh, the actual suppliers. So I think the more you can put them forward and shine a little light on them, the better it is. And how do you do that? A lot of people, you can highlight it on your menu. Now you can put it on your social media everywhere. Um, and hopefully they have a bit of a presence too. So when you direct people to their websites, to their social, um, people can then like our guests can start interacting with them directly. Remove ourselves and they can just be like, talking about their farming together. Yeah, same. I mean, our relationships, uh, my whole 
it's all about the farms for us. I mean, we've constantly said like, we don't make our own menu. Our menu is based on what our farmers are bringing to us. That is how we, that's what dictates our menus. So it's all about their passion. And the, the storytelling that we do in our restaurant, and it is in person, it's not through takeout for the acorn anyways. You know, it's all an in-person storytelling experience for us and online and social media, but like to really get that, to be like this, you know, this tomato is from this row in this farm and to be able to, to sort of talk through it or and, and new and wild crafting ingredients is really, I think, helps to give more of that experience to our customers and helps them appreciate the value of eating from your area. Um, sure, I'm gonna keep you uh, on, the, on the question just to, someone's asked if, uh, if you've ever considered growing food for your restaurant. Um, now I know maybe in the early days of the Acorn, that was something that you were doing. I'm not too sure, is that something you're still doing? And we still do. We still have an acorn garden. Uh, we tried to grow more veggies, but we couldn't keep up with the demand for the amount of space that we had. We work with Victory Gardens Co-op. They help uh, educate our staff on um, maintaining our gardens and harvesting. They work with us to, uh, yeah, like to teach and um, both restaurants have gardens, but now mostly they're like edible blossoms. They're more like herbs and things that we can create and grow enough of to be able to, to supply our own restaurants. But a lot of our farms now also grow items specifically for us. So we start to have communicate with them early on in the season when they're starting to plant and they ask what we want, what we want to see more of. So that's, that's like the testament to the strength of our relationships with them is that we're sort of working together now. And Justin, how about for you guys? We, unfortunately, it's a bit of a cop out of an answer, but Juke is a really small space in Chinatown. So we don't have, there's not like no a roof. three square foot anywhere. Yeah. There's no roof, there's no parking lot, nothing. Um, Beatbox is a little bit differently. That's where we work a lot closer with our suppliers. Um, but again, there as well, uh, we don't own the property and the parking lot is in cars. So we, we don't really have a, an area to do that in. Um, we, I know my chef and business partner Brian would love to. Like that's that's his thing. Like he's he's from a small town on the island and he loves doing that. Um, and kind of what Shira said, it's hard to keep up to that demand when you have such a small footprint to do it in. Especially in an urban in an urban setting. Yeah. Uh, one question that was posed that a lot of people are curious about is uh, has the pandemic uh, or how has the pandemic impacted the way you prevent uh, food waste? Robert, you kind of touched on it a little bit talking about uh, froze, shipping frozen yeah, seafood. I mean, the but, pandemic's uh, never really changed my position on it. It's been my position for 30 years. Um, so it really, I mean, I learned a lot from the, this pandemic has really um, molded me or, or sent me in a, in, in a not in a new direction, but certainly changed who I am or how I look at things. But as far as the handling of food, food waste, food production, it, it's, it's only strengthened my, the argument that I've been having for, for 30 years, the importance of, of being able to take care of yourself. Um, so yeah, like food, food f the, the concept of, of shipping fresh food, and there's nothing wrong with going, go to Langley, get yourself a fresh cabbage, that's beautiful, or have a fresh cabbage from Langley, come to you, that's beautiful. But having a, a cabbage fresh shipped from halfway around the world is, is ludicrous. Uh, it, it just doesn't make any sense. For, and here I'm telling stories again. 40 years ago, sitting in bars in Toronto as an apprentice, arguing with other apprentices, the biggest bragging point we used to have is my hotel is better than your hotel because we're serving blueberries from New Zealand in February. I've come a long way from that position. And I think uh, our industry has come a long way from that position. And I think as a society, we need to come a long way from that position to, to move forward successfully as, as, a, as, as, I mean, I thought it was cool in 1982, not so cool in 19 uh, or 2021, right? So yeah, it hasn't changed anything for me because I've always, it's, it's only strengthened my resolve that, uh, that, um, 
the people that I listen to or respect as far as how food production systems should work, it's strengthening uh, their argument uh, 100%. Like UBC. I'd say the same Absolutely. on our end. Uh, being a small business, we've always been pretty conscious. Like we can't waste anything because A, it's bad for the environment. B, you can't really afford to do it. So we've found ways to use, you know, at the end of the night, if there's any food left, like that goes into stocks that gets broken down into other things. Like we make sure in both our businesses, there's like no food waste. Well, not none, but approaching zero as best we can. Yeah, then Acorn's mentality has always been like a seed stem, seed to stem, stem to root, whatever mentality. So we're taking carrot top. We're putting that into pesto, taking, you know, like we're using every, this peels and we're making vinegars. Like we just don't, we, we're just be as creative as we can with whatever scraps that we have in the restaurant trim. No one ever, no one ever talks about that, but the amount of waste that kitchens, professional kitchens produce isn't as significant as the amount of waste that the actual consumer, now that I don't own a restaurant, I can say this with impunity, uh, um, they produce. I mean, it's, it's common for people it's just like they, you know, they order, they, they order more than they're going to, they even know they're going to eat, knowing it's going to be thrown in the garbage. And, and historically we have a tendency to make uh, portions too big or to make the plate look full to uh, to give give the perception of value uh, and we never approached it from a from a uh, logical uh, or a logical sustainable point of view as you know this is enough they're not going to eat more than that or if you want more eat more i mean order more um but we i mean the amount of garbage in the restaurant industry that goes in off of the customer's plates and not because they didn't like it, it's because they, I've seen people, whatever, order a steak with Bernays sauce. They don't like eggs, they don't like tarragon, and they don't like Bernays, but they insist they get the sauce on the side only to sit there and then be thrown out because, hey, I paid for it. I want to see this sauce. I mean, that's ludicrous, but it happens every day in our industry, well, in, in my former industry. I am really bringing a negative thing to this. <laughs> Kids, you got to lighten this back. up, please. Opening people you back, youthfulness, sure. this crusty old guy is just getting way too much. Anita. Guys, we need a yin and yang. That's why you're yeah. there. Yeah. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so for the three of you, what advice uh, would you give for uh, people who are just thinking about getting into this industry? Um, there's a lot of experience on this panel. Um, uh, and uh, so what kind of advice would you give if they, for people wanting to enter into this industry as an owner operator? Well, I think that being flexible is key. I think you can go in with an idea, you have all the intention to do X. And if your customers are coming at you saying, we want Y, we want X with a little bit of Y. And you know, you you just need to be able to have flexibility to work in real time to make make change and do whatever is making the change for the better of, you know, your community, your world, your restaurant, whatever it is. But like, I think flexibility is, is absolute key. Let's say be calm and resilient, knowing that in restaurants, the only guarantee is you're going to spend money. No guarantee people are coming in uh, and know your product better than anyone else. I say patience. I mean, one of the the challenges in our industry is uh, is the the youthful enthusiasm of uh, of the upcoming generation. Um, if they just had a little bit more patience and toler tolerated, I mean, if they have a dream, that's saying wait, be patient until the opportunity is presented to you to make a difference, and then make a difference. You're not gonna. You won't make a difference. Your, your idea, your concept, your direction, your philosophy, all of it could be the best, most solid position to be in. But if you're the apprentice, the chef may or may not be interested in it. And you're not going to get that opportunity unless to be the chef, unless you unless you have patience. And I think you can change the world with patience. I've been patient a long time. With you, Darren. No. And I appreciate it, Rob. <laughs> Uh, Justin, you, you touched a little bit on the food delivery uh, apps, and um, 
I'm just curious what everyone else's thoughts are. Um, we know there's been a, a learning curve with them and, and a lot has been learned uh, um, as that uh, sector it, it has come into the picture because we know it's here to stay. So I'm just curious about what uh, some, you know, Robert and Shira, what your thoughts are on, uh, on the food delivery apps. Ooh, you um, want the negative or the positive? <laughs> you go first, Robert. <laughs> I'll go Give first. us a bit of both. And Robert. you can. I don't have both. I only have the negative. <laughs> I don't. Um, yeah, I don't. Uh, first of all, I don't like the uh, state. I don't agree with the statement. We know they're here to stay. That's what somebody, a couple of food critics, told me 25 years ago about sam farm and salmon and open net pets in British Columbia. That it was here to stay, to learn to live with it. I think we're seeing evidence that that's not true. That with with persistence and 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 research we can actually do the right thing uh, so the apps aren't necessarily here to stay we do, they're here to stay if we choose for them to here to stay i i'm a believer and I, this isn't against the, the food delivery systems but i truly truly cannot accept a system where the mediator the the broker the the in-between makes more money than the producer i.e whether it's the farmer the restaurant the chef and the customer like so any system, any system was set up that, that the majority of the profit is made by somebody that has no vested interest other than connecting two people together. Generally, as a rule, I avoid it like the plague. Uh, now, I'm, I'm out of the industry, so I have no idea. I'm only looking from the outside in how important these can or cannot be to, to the individual restaurants. And I'm sure each, each story or system is different. But for me personally, I would... I, I, would not partake in it in any way, shape, or form, though I don't judge those that, that do. I can't ever imagine using it, but that's because I'm old, right? If I was 21, maybe that's the only way I get my food. Get my bubble tea, get my, who knows, right? All delivered by Uber. That's a plug for Uber. I don't even know. <laughs> Save the Jira, situation. Well, okay, yeah. So I, I think these apps work only for a restaurant when you're at capacity. So if you have all of your seats full and then on top of that, you're selling extra, then you know you can kind of justify a little bit more um, that sort of 30% that they're taking. And not a lot of restaurants get the bargaining leverage that you got, Justin. You know, most don't. I hate that they're taking advantage of, of primarily you know, independently run businesses. And like what Robert says, like, I, I, I agree, they're making more than the restaurants. And in the pandemic, where it was the only way for some to stay alive, like Arbor, for instance, we just had no choice but to bite the bullet. And it was uh, awful. And when they did sort of cap their rates at 15, it was actually 20% because it was 15 plus five. So that, that part got sort of swept under the rug because 15 was better for, I don't know, the reports and the news. And I think that the way that they did that was only temporary until the pandemic's over. So who knows if they've already reverted back to the 30%. I should be checking. So I stopped paying attention. Um, but I think the what I hope we can see in the future is companies like From2, who we worked with at the Acorn, a local company started by Brandon from Pigeon, who had zero commission fees. And if you wanted to order from Acorn, you had to look it up. So hopefully, you know, if you want to order from Juke, you're going to look on from to you. So you sort of, it needs to kind of work the other way around where you're not discovering a restaurant through the app. You sort of want the food. Then you look for it and through the restaurant, you find the app. Um, but maybe there'll be more companies like that, or maybe there'll be more like a white glove service or something that's just like, it's in our hands. As a, as a business and we don't have to pay so much to this like, who know, giant companies for nothing, like for an app. I, from two, look it up, use from two. Justin, anything you wanted to add? Uh, no, I, I kind of agree with both of those, kind of what Shira said as well, is there, no one talked about that 5% service charge that was on top of that 15. Um, but, you know, when we were looking at our business, as I said, we were smaller, we weren't going to have high guest checks. I was already working on what like takeout or delivery would be, meaning like what our insurance would be, how many drivers we'd have to have, basically what pizza companies yeah. were doing before. 
Um, and so that's the brilliance of something like from two is, you know, it, it keeps it in your hands. And the other thing is with those big delivery companies, um, they own all the IP. You don't get those emails, you know, those email addresses from people who are ordering from you. Um, there's not a ton of care in how that food's delivered or how quickly it's done. Uh, uh, we've got, as, as I said, we're fortunate. We have really good relationships with our delivery partners, uh, but we knew other people didn't. So jumping back a bit to what Robert was saying earlier about community, I also think independent restaurants need to realize they're not independent amongst each other. Like if independent restaurants got together, you have a lot of bargaining power and you've got a lot of power yeah. between you to help each other, to support each other and like push change really forward. Uh, so that's one thing that I've always been an advocate of. And I think in Chinatown, we're looking a lot at that just with the restaurants around us, but I think we need to expand on that. Just to be a troublemaker, which historically I'm known for, I think the president of the Chef's Table Society, it could be, there could be some initiative for that, uh, that organization here. To uh, I second make that. some positive yeah, change. <laughs> thank, thank you all for that. <laughs> I'll make some phone calls. Um, Justin, just to stay with you, uh, many of our frontline workers in the food industry, uh, as you talked about, are BIPOC, and I'm just wondering how we can support them uh, coming out of this pandemic uh, moving forward. Yeah, I, I feel that I've had a lot of conversations around this topic the past kind of 12 months. Um, the first thing I always say is, I don't think we're asking for anything. Like no one's asking for money. No one's asking for preferential treatment. I think people are just asking for equality. Um, so in terms of how to handle it, how to take care of it, I think be, be sensitive to the way you may speak to some people. A lot of people don't understand the privilege they've had because you've just grown up a certain way. I'm also a little bit different. Like I'm a person of color, but I was adopted into a Caucasian family when I was a kid. So I kind of get to see both sides. Um, so I think sensitivity is the start and then you work forward from there. Uh, but in terms of the restaurant industry, it's like, I think everyone's in the same boat, right? Like everyone wants to be the best at what they do. You want to work hard and treat people with respect. Um, I think we're going to, uh, it was a, it was a great, uh, it was a great, uh, conversation. I want to thank you guys all. Uh, I just want to give each one of you uh, an opportunity to, um, any last comments that you may have, um, uh, about any of the subjects we talked about, or I guess, Justin, we can start with you if you, uh, no, just a big thank you. I think the more, you know, the more of these conversations that are out there, the more awareness people are having to what, you know, farmers, to independent restaurants, to like local communities doing. And the more you can shine light on that, uh, the more people need to know about it, the more they can support it. So thank you. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm grateful to be here. And I think that the work that I want to do moving forward is just pushing towards making this industry a better place for its it's people and hopefully, I, don't, I mean, there's just so much work to do coming out of this. We're still in it, you know? I mean, the survivability is still like unknown, I think for some of restaurants, we're not, you know, we're still relying heavily on the subsidies that are being provided by the government. So I think um, there's just a lot, of, a lot, like I kind of finished with a lot of work to do, a lot of learning, a lot of conversations that need to happen for everybody. So let's just keep, keep it going. I, I agree with Justin and Shira. And for, for moving forward, regardless of who you are or what you do or in, within this industry or outside this industry, we all have a role to play and we all need to participate in the conversations and in the work that's gonna to help us move forward in a, in a positive way. And uh, I, hope that, I hope to see that happen. And I, and I think it will. You know, the pandemic I think is has stirred up a lot of things that we, we, we knew, knew or know are to be true, but we kind of ignored, pretended that they didn't exist. Now we know they do exist and it has to be, it has to be rectified. And I think we're in a position that, that we're able to do that or start. Doing Thank you. That. Thank you. 
Um, I know there were some questions that we didn't get to, but I just want to thank everyone for uh, sharing your time uh, and your questions. Uh, please keep an eye out for a follow-up email, which will address some of these questions and share some resources on what we've learned today. Uh, of course, thank you so much to our presenters, Shira Bluestein, Robert Clark, and Justin Tisdale um, for their honesty and candor. Really appreciate it. Uh, behind the scenes, we want to thank uh, Melody Cooksdorf, Red Norton and Jacqueline Chan, who made this all happen. Uh, and please join us next week for our episode titled Taking on Food Insecurity with our School Food Systems, which will be on July 22nd from noon to 1.30 uh, Pacific time. And please let us know what you thought about the webinar. Uh, you will be directed to a short survey about this session after, and we would really appreciate any feedback that you would have. Uh, also feel free to visit us at UBC Farm .ubc.ca. And once again, thank you all very much for joining in the conversation. And we look forward to continuing the discussion.